Welcome all. Today I'd like to outline an approach to tackling the problem of climate change. Modest introduction, and by way of illustration, I'm going to talk about just one aspect, one of the many challenges that face us in, in climate change, and that is stemming the uh, destruction of the tropical rainforests. I'm going to talk about what we've learned about how to do that and how we've learned it. Uh, it's important because, uh, as you know, tropical rainforest uh, loss is not only a, a major threat to biodiversity, it's also the source of maybe one-fifth to one-sixth of all the greenhouse gases that people are pumping into the atmosphere. But before we turn to, uh, to forests, I want to talk about why I, I'm concerned about uh, climate change. Because I'm, I'm frequently running into people who say, why worry? Climate science isn't, isn't very precise. We don't know exactly how much warming there's going to be. Let's just wait and see how things turn out. Uh, but for me, and for many, this uncertainty is, is really cause for action and not for inaction. Uh, in many realms of life, in our, in our personal life, in life as a nation, we're faced with big choices, big decisions to make, important consequences against an uncertain future. Should I buy life insurance? How much should the country spend to protect against pandemic uh, flu? In the end, you have to size up the, the odds, place your bet, make a decision. Uh, in the climate context, I think this has beautifully been illustrated by a group at MIT, the Joint Center for Climate Change there. Uh, they've got a very fancy model for predicting what's going to happen to the climate. And they said, OK, we know there are uncertainties about the exact way the, the atmosphere behaves. Certainly, there are uncertainties about how, climate's going to, uh, how the economy is going to evolve. Let's run our model for every possible combination of those uncertainties and see what the odds are of a good versus a bad outcome. This is what they came up with. They said, imagine one of these wheels of fortune. Uh, if we do nothing, it's like giving this wheel a big spin. So it's going to spin round and round, and it's going to settle on a temperature change for the next century. And what it says is the, that the best we could hope for, if we do nothing, the best we could hope for would be a five degree Fahrenheit rise over this century. Now, for us in the US, that would be uncomfortable. That would be pretty bad, actually. But we're, we're wealthy enough that we could probably find ways to adapt to it. Uh, for the developing world, for people who are exposed to storm surges, people on low-lying deltas that are going to get, get flooded, people exposed to flood and drought, uh, this could be very serious indeed. And remember, five degrees is the best outcome for the turn of this wheel. They said that there's a 25% chance, one chance in four, that we'll end up in that orange zone. That's a 10 to 12 degree increase over this century. And there's one chance in 11 that we get the 12 to 15 degrees. 12 to 15 degrees in a century. That is, I think, more than the change since, since the last ice age. It leaves us in a world that's literally unimaginable, within the lifetime of the children of the people in this room, maybe within the lifetime of some of the people in this room. Uh, so for me, this, I think, is a compelling argument for taking out insurance against uh, a risk of that magnitude. So what do we have to do? Well, in broad brush, the, the answer is uh, obvious. We have to stop uh, putting gunk in the atmosphere. Uh, we're burning coal for power, burning gasoline for transport, and what I want to focus, focus on today is we're burning trees to make room for farms and forests. And this ties into uh, some of our earlier talks. Why is this happening? If we want to solve this problem, we have to figure out who is doing this and why. Uh, the answer is, is not too difficult. People do it because they profit by doing so. Some of the deforesters are, are very poor farmers who might clear just a hectare, a couple of acres, to create a farm that's worth $100, a pathetically small gain. Uh, in other cases, in, in parts of Latin America and Brazil, uh, people are, are clearing 500, 1,000 hectares at a time, wealthy individuals, corporations, uh, and they're making about $200 a hectare from, from doing that. Well, it began to dawn on people that there was a mismatch here. Uh, in creating these farms, trees are burned, they decompose, they, carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. Right now, today, people in Europe are paying $20 a ton to keep carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
Actually, I checked the quote this morning. It's $19.57, but uh, it goes up and down. Anyway, what that means is that, is that it's worth $10,000 to keep that forest standing. So we, ha we have this incredible paradox. People are destroying a carbon asset, a living forest that's worth $10,000 a hectare, to create a farm asset that's worth $100, $200, maybe in the extreme case $3,000 for an oil palm plantation or, or a soybean farm, but still far less than $10,000. So over the last uh, several years, people have be begun to scratch their heads and say, this doesn't make sense at all. Why destroy something worth $10,000 to create something worth $100? Surely we can figure something out. And right now, the outlines of this, of this deal are taking place at the global scale. Diplomats are trying to hammer it out. Uh, in, in broad brush, what it means is that the developed world would find a way to, to reward the developing countries for keeping their forests intact. The developing countries would take this money and use it to support sustainable agriculture that would provide the food and the timber and the jobs that are causing people to cut down the forest in the first place. And actual money is on the table right now. The Norwegians, for instance, have put up several billion dollars to, to jumpstart this, this initiative. But again, if this is going to happen, if, if this deal really comes into place, what would we do? What would we actually do on the ground? How would we go about stopping deforestation? Now, uh, by trade, I'm an evaluator, so it's natural for me to stop and, and say, well, have we ever tried anything like this before? Is there anything, any past experience we could learn from? And of course, in fact, people have been concerned about loss of rainforests for at least 20 or 30 years. And there's been, been work done. In fact, one of the, the main activities that's been done to fight forest loss has been to create protected areas, national parks, wilderness reserves, things like that. Uh, this has been a big effort, no small effort at all. In fact, at this point, quite a large chunk of, of the entire world's real estate is in some form of a protected area. Uh, right now, we figure a little bit more than a quarter of the remaining tropical forest is under some form of protection. You can see the, the protected areas in, in color there. Uh, in total area, this is about Argentina and Bolivia put together. It's taken about uh, six, seven billion dollars at least has been put into this effort. And you might then ask, well, what's been the result? Uh, what's happened? Have, has this stopped deforestation? What's been the impact? The answer, amazingly enough, is that, that we don't know. There's no consensus. Uh, you can find three views. One view says, yeah, these, these protected areas uh, more or less work. They're not perfect, but they, they've been uh, a tool for conserving forests. There's a net another view of people who scoff and say, no, these are mere paper parks. They're just uh, lines on the map. They have, they have no meaning. They have no impact. Uh, there's a third group who says, well, these, these uh, parks, these protected areas work only too well. They're exclusionary. They keep local people out of, uh, from access to the land and the, the forests and the resources they need. Well, how could it be that after 20 years of this effort, we still don't know what's going on? And I think there are two answers. First, the data are abominable. It's really amazing, and I'll, I'll come back to this point, that after 20 or 30 years of concern about uh, deforestation, there is still not a timely, comprehensive, consistent, global map of deforestation, something that keeps us up to date about what's happening where. And there's certainly no information about the livelihood, the well-being of the people who live, uh, live on the, the forest edges, live in the forests. The second is that it's all too easy to fall into what I'll call a naive armchair assessment of the impact of these, uh, these protected areas. And let me illustrate to you uh, the, the perils of, of naive assessment. So let's take a look. Here's a satellite view of the Castanera uh, State Extractive Reserve in the state of Rondonia in, um, in Brazil. The, uh, the red line shows you the, the boundaries of this park. Uh, the, the reddish globs are where satellites have detected uh, forest fires in the last 10 years. And you can see that outside the park, you see clearing for farms, you see a, a, a grid of, of roads, uh, but the settlement seems to come to, to uh, seems to end at the edges of the park. Looking at this, it looks pretty reasonable to conclude that that park has been effective in, in preventing deforestation. 
Let me give you another view. Here's the Gunung Loiser National Park in Indonesia. Uh, again, we see a, a red line outlining the, the boundary of this park. And outside the park, you see it, well, I'm not sure how well it shows up here, but uh, you, you see the, the land has been pretty well chopped up into to farmed areas. Inside the park, it seems, uh, seems green and verdant. I'm sure that there are, are loggers at work in there, uh, but we don't seem to see the same kind of, of conversion to, to agriculture that we see outside. So, can we conclude that the, uh, the, the park has been successful in preventing deforestation? Well, there's another explanation. We've, we've exaggerated the, uh, uh, the vertical elevation here to make, to make the point, but if you were a farmer, you probably would not want to try farming on some of these steep slopes. It's a very, very unattractive place to, to, uh, to farm. And so it's quite likely that rather than the, the park protecting the forest, the park has been, been established in a place which no one really uh, had, had a very strong claim to. It's become a park because no one had, had strong claims to agriculture there. And so, a simple comparison of what's going on inside and what's going on outside can lead you astray. Uh, it might lead you to, to, to conclude that some parks are really effective. It might lead you incorrectly to conclude that some are not. So that was the, the problem we faced. Uh, we worked with a colleague, uh, Andy Nelson, and here's how we, we attacked these problems. First, in the absence of a, um, as I said, there's no, there's no global map of deforestation. Next best thing, we do have good data on where there are fires. So we were able to locate where are there forest fires, where have there been forest fires in the world in the last, uh, last eight years, 10 years. Uh, we were able to locate where the protected areas were, and we did a matching. We matched each protected area with a place that had similar terrain, similar climate, similar remoteness from roads, so that we could do a case control, compare, make a fair comparison between what's going on in a protected area and what's going on in a similar, similar kind of place. So we could really isolate what's the, um, what's the effect of protection. So what did we find? Uh, I won't go through the, the colorful graph, but I'll, I'll tell, you, tell you what we found. We looked first at strict protected areas. These are areas where you're not allowed to do anything except conservation. People are not allowed to go in and, and clear small farms. Nothing, nothing like that's allowed. And what we found is that these were not mere paper parks. On average, these, these did have protective effect. They weren't quite as effective as the naive armchair view would, would tell you, but they, they did have protective impact. Then we looked at multiple use protected areas. These are areas where local people can go in, where they do have the right to go in, gather forest products, uh, do things sustainably within the, within the forest. Now you might expect these to fare less well than the strictly protected parks, but we found just the opposite. We found that these, these multiple use areas actually on average did better than the strictly protected areas, and they did better than the naive estimate would, would suggest. But the big surprise, I think, came when we looked at indigenous areas. There's been a growing movement to return forests to the control of the, the indigenous people who have traditionally lived there. And when we looked at the impact of the indigenous areas, we found that it was virtually off the chart. These, these areas, on average, had huge protective impact on reducing deforestation, and it wasn't recognized. It was far greater than the naive estimate would suggest. Uh, suggesting that these areas were, were actually under a fair degree of pressure, and so the, the, the protective effect of having it under indigenous control wasn't fully recognized. So this gives us hope, I think, that the idea of reconciling, reconciling forest conservation with the well-being of the people who live in the forest uh, may be more possible than people would have thought. But this is really only the very first step. If there's going to be a global effort to, to conserve forests for their carbon value and for all their other, other values, it's going to be a very, very complicated endeavor, and we need much more, much more examination of what's going on. But by now, I think maybe you've figured out what my, uh, what my secret strategy is for, um, for addressing climate change. It's to pay attention. Uh, figure out what's going on. Try something and see if it works. If it doesn't, doesn't work, give it up. If it does work, scale it up. Now, this may seem trite and obvious, but 
the fact that people worried about deforestation for 20 years without bothering to do a map of where deforestation was, was uh, taking place gives you a hint that this is not actually standard practice. And we need to apply this practice in all the many challenges that face us in, in uh, addressing climate change, in transport, in energy, in agriculture, across the board. But I have hope that this may become increasingly possible. For one thing, information is becoming very cheap. It's now possible to do things that were undreamt of just a few years ago. So uh, as an example, let me tell you what, what some colleagues over at the Center for Global Development are doing. Uh, they've taken some of the same uh, satellite data that we used for our, our, far, for our fire monitoring, and they've rigged up a system that can run on a simple PC using publicly available information that lets you monitor deforestation on an almost real-time basis. It's not exactly perfect uh, monitoring, but, but they, can, they can identify with high probability where deforestation is taking place. They hope to be able to scale this up to the whole world so that any, anybody anywhere, any NGO, can use this to figure out what is going on in their neighborhood. Uh, another example, it's a project that was undertaken by the World Bank with uh, funds from the Global Environmental Facility. Uh, much of the Latin American forest has been converted to, been converted to pasture. Now, the ranchers tend not to like trees in their, in their pasture. They think, reasonably enough, that the trees compete with grass, it's going to hurt their profits. So what this project did is that it set up literally an experiment. They said to the ranchers, we're going to pay you to try something. We're going to pay you to plant more trees in your pasture and see what happens. And what they found out is that they could increase the tree cover up to as much as 20% and the farmer's profits would increase. Uh, why is this true? Well, the, uh, the cows like the shade and the cows like nibbling on the, on the trees. The cows got happy, the cows got fat. If the cows were happy, the ranchers were happy. Meanwhile, there's more, more trees in the pasture, more carbon being sequestered out of the atmosphere, and it also served to increase, it served as a biodiversity corridor, so the birds were happy too. So this is one of those rare examples where everything works out the way you, you'd hoped. And the great thing about this is that it was very well documented. They were able to convince other people that this was going to work, and this is a bit being massively scaled up in Colombia right now. So to conclude, meanwhile, uh, carbon dioxide is kicking up year by year in the atmosphere. Uh, we're gaining about two parts per million every year. That may not sound very much, but it's a really, really big atmosphere. Um, there are some people who, who say that uh, for stability, we need, need to stabilize the, the concentration at 350. We've long since blown past uh, 350 parts per million. There are other people who say that, that we really had better stabilize around 450. That's not very far off, uh, only about uh, 20 years off from now. So if we're going to do this, we have to figure out what works. We have to, to figure out how it works, and we have to learn quickly. Thanks very much.